Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Today's session is designed to provide you with, oh, let's open up the PowerPoint so folks can see it. <laughs> and while that's happening, um, designed well, excuse me, oh, Mary, um, I lost my permission to share screen. Gay, could you please make me co-host? Oh, <laughs> There you go. Thanks. You're welcome. Great. Today's session is designed to provide you with information regarding the general supervision and monitoring activities and the timelines for special purpose private schools that are in the 2024-25 cohort, as well as an opportunity for you to ask questions. We'll start with introduction. Um, I'm Mary Adley. I'm the coordinator for state agency programs, um, the Office of <clears throat> Special Services and Inclusive Education at the Department of Education, and I will pass it off to my colleague, Sarah. Hi, Sarah Ferguson. I work on Mary's team. And Gay. Okay. Gay, okay, you were muted. No sound. You're good. Of course I was muted. I'm Gay Erskine. I am an administrative assistant for this team. And Leora. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself, please, Leora? Oh, she's not, she's having trouble with her mic. So Leora Byrus is also uh, an education specialist on my team uh, that we are so pleased to have her join us um, working with folks on, um, on the standards-based reporting and in the process of starting up some community of practices that she introduced last fall. Thank you, Mary. Can you guys hear me now? We can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and um, I want to note that Barbara McGowan is unable to join us today, and I will provide an overview of the fiscal information later in the presentation. Let's begin with a general supervision flowchart to provide a visual depiction of the monitoring process for special purpose private schools. And if you want to zoom in on the flowchart uh, while I'm reviewing information, that would be great, Sarah. So this is an overview of the specific elements of the desk audit and the site visit. Um, and we'll um, be talking about each of those in detail uh, during this webinar today. The letter of notification and instruction was sent last month uh, with this webinar schedule. The SPPS monitoring process has two components, the site visit activities and the desk audit sections. The process for both of these components mirrors each other. After evidence is submitted and reviewed, <clears throat> a letter of finding is sent to both SPPSs and their referring SAU partners. When the elements in the site visit and the desk audit are each fulfilled, a letter of approval is sent. And corrective activity that's submitted will be view reviewed as it comes in until the due date. If there are outstanding elements from either the desk audit or the site visit, a corrective action plan or cap will be issued. And again, corrective evidence will be reviewed as it's submitted. And a final approval letter will be issued to the special purpose private school when all elements in the cap are satisfied. Thanks. Once every three years, each SPPS will be uh, monitored to evaluate out of unit placement as outlined in user and to ensure continued approval status. Each special purpose private school has been placed into a monitoring cohort for the purpose of monitoring special education activities in these schools and a table capturing the 2024 through 2029 cohorts is on the department's website. 
the general system of supervision and monitoring forms that the state agency programs team uses were emailed to the cohort previously. Thanks, Gay, for doing that. We'll be pausing periodically throughout the presentation today to see if you have questions. Feel free to call or email the members of the Aussie State Agency Programs team if you think of questions after the webinar. Our contact information is listed on the last slide of this presentation. And this webinar is being recorded and a link will be put in the department special services website or on the department special services website so that you or your staff can access it as needed. We would like to briefly review <clears throat> the events in the supervision and monitoring process before take, talking about each component in more depth. We'll conduct site visits in the summer and the fall this year with backup days in the winter if necessary. <clears throat> Gay will work with each agency to identify preferred times for the site visit for each location in their organization and has already scheduled a couple for this summer. At each site visit, the department has historically reviewed student files, interviewed the staff and students, and toured the facility. A one and a half hour exit interview to debrief the site visit portion of the review will be scheduled for another day over Zoom. Thank you. Activities, Thank you. activities that occur during the site visit, including classroom observations and interviews are meant to be proactive and support SPPSs as they refine the desk audit components, such as adequacy of services, continuum of services, educational environment, and plan of instruction. Recommendations made during the site visit that are adequately addressed prior to the subsequent desk audit will result in no finding for that desk audit component. The desk audit submissions are due December 27th. So the list of events that occur may in your during your review may not necessarily be in the order that they will occur for your SPPF, especially if unexpected um, events require rescheduled visits be postponed and rescheduled, or scheduled visits be postponed and rescheduled. Each SPPS will receive two separate letters of findings. One upon completion of site visit activities, approximately a month afterward, and the other one by the end of January of 2025 for the desk audit component of your review. The letters will be issued and communicate if there are findings of concern within the program that might affect approval status. The special purpose private school will have time between the letter of finding and May 9th, 2025 to resolve any identified areas requiring resolution or revision. SPPS file review corrective activity is for future work rather than fixing past errors. So that's different than SAUs. If training is required to address multiple findings in the file review, please only send one letter of assurance that identifies all trainings for the findings. So for example, if your SPPS had file review findings for OOU5, ISR1, and IEP41, you would only need to send one letter of assurance that your training was provided for anyone writing IEPs, covering all three of those topics. In addition, for IEP file review findings, please send IEPs that are developed after the findings were issued. And they can be annual reviews, amendments, or drafts if not yet approved and issued by the SAU. It's expected that five uh, students' IEPs will show evidence for all of the identified areas that are requiring correction on the IEP, and only three of which would address um, transition corrective activity elements because those are only a, um, applicable to a subset of your SPPS population if you serve high school students. So a total of five IEPs per SPPS site that would demonstrate um, necessary correction for any file review findings. If any of the concerns identified in the letters of finding remain outstanding as of May 9th, 2025, the department will issue a corrective action plan to address those findings. And if all matters are resolved before the due date, the department will issue a letter of um, acknowledging successful completion of monitoring and consequently continued school approval. Note, only the portions of the IEP relevant to SPPS monitoring will be evaluated 
on the IEPs that are selected for the file review. And when you are sending additional evidence that's required, please only scan the sections of the IEP that are requested for evidence review. Isolated deficiencies discovered during the file review that impact the provision of FAPE will need to be corrected and will be reported to the federal monitoring or public school monitoring team. So for example, um, neglecting to reduce the total um, spe uh, specially designed instruction time by the amount of time that the student receives related services at the frequency determined by the IEP team could result in compensatory education awarded through due process proceedings and would be viewed as a violation of FAPE. SPPSs will provide evidence to address elements identified in the CAP um, by September 19th, 2025. Once the evidence for the CAP has been submitted and approved, the department will issue an approval letter. You do not need to wait till the due date to submit evidence for either the finding, letters of findings or the CAP. Monitoring is an interactive process and we're here to support you throughout that process. The Department Special Services Fiscal Team is joining the State Agency Programs Team for the for FY25 SPPS General Supervision Cohorts. And the information pertinent to this portion of the review will be presented um, on Barbara's behalf later in the presentation. You've already received the letter of notification and instruction. The purpose of the notification is to inform the special purpose private school of its inclusion in the current cohort of a general system supervision and monitoring during the 24-25 school year. We sent notification about this webinar to all the SAUs that each SPPS identified as currently having students enrolled or um, pending enrollments from, and we appreciate those districts that have been able to take the time to join us today. The letter of notification and instruction describes the two components of the general supervision process in which documentation is submitted to the SAP team, our state agency programs team, in a desk audit. The first element, uh, program approval documents, it's outlined in sections one through 11 in the table containing all the criteria found in the program approval section of MUSER, along with some additional program requirements from the general school approval. The documentation to be submitted in support of those criteria is also described. For the second part, section 12, SPPSs will review the student files that they maintain on a certain number of students and complete the on-site review monitoring tool, or we call it the OSR tool, to document whether the records reviewed contained all the required materials. This OSR tool has been developed and revised to be consistent with the tool that the, uh, that's used by the federal um, monitoring team. We'll be using that same tool for the site visit file review. In review, GAY is in the process of scheduling site visits for each location in your organization. While on site, the department will review student files, interview staff and students, and tour the facility campus, and. Um, during a subsequent uh, Zoom meeting, conduct an exit interview to debrief the site visit portion of the review. The site visits will be planned as in-person events this year with a pivot if circumstances warrant it. The state agency program team ap appreciates everyone's flexibility and emphasizes the necessity for us to maintain communication regarding circumstances that might warrant alternate plans. So both parties may observe each organization's health and safety, employee and visitor policies and procedures. Prior to the site visit, each SPPS will receive a site visit letter from the department confirming the date and reviewing the expectations for the site visit. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, we ask that the director of the program be present to assist in the in the site visit. And if the program uh, director is unavailable for the full day, the department asks that the director uh, assign an assistant or a coordinator to be available during the times so that the director is not available. And during the site visit, 
the SAP team wants to offer your SPPS live professional development. Um, to some of your special education teachers. Um, so we invite them to sit with the department staff um, to review elements of the IEP that are included in the OSR review. Um, teachers will be able to get feedback and ask questions about anything regarding special education um, and ask for feedback and uh, an interactive process. Uh, we'd like to note staff participating in this should be focusing on an IEP that they've written um, and, and are uh, providing instruction or oversight for programming for. And we also want to note that um, we will need to have a confidential workspace for the um, SAP team to review the files and we'll need access to a copy or a scanner. And with uh, for agencies with multiple sites or locations, we request that the files for all of your locations be put in one uh, in one site. Um, and we can work together with you to figure out which location that would be uh, the best to have that happen. Excuse me. And um, throughout monitoring, uh, are we, as you know, travel throughout the state of Maine. And our intent <laughs> is to begin the day by 8.30. Um, and so within the day, we're gonna need time to do the following, some of which will occur simultaneously. We um, typically like to start our day with an administrative um, interview because that helps provide context for the day. Uh, we want time to tour your facility, your campus, and also to do classroom observation. We wanna be able to um, uh, do the, the tour during a time that students are working. And also want to note that we'd like to have um, a couple of complete observations from start to finish uh, class periods. We're gonna need time to uh, review 10 student files and also time to conduct interviews to teachers, to ed techs, to related service providers typically um, we ask to have the teachers together, the ed techs together, and the related service providers together. They often um, uh, work uh, with in tandem with each other um, and are there to support each other. Um, we also want to um, interview a couple of students, and we'll need consent to do that. We do those interviews individually for confidentiality purposes, and just want to note that um, whatever support is um, is desired by the student is perfectly fine. If they want to have an ed tech with them, that's fine. Um, and then uh, we typically have a working lunch and would love to have anybody join us. And um, it doesn't, uh, for conversation, it doesn't have to be related to the site visit. So that's our, that's our, our uh, and again, some of these things will happen at the same time. So those are the activities we'd like to get accomplished while we're on site. And anything that needs to be followed up on, we will um, uh, uh, schedule some follow-up Zoom times. Um, and, whoops, I'm on the wrong slide here. <laughs> the review team, um, oh, you need to change slides, Sarah, please. Next slide. Um, yes, but I first wanna note that the consent for the student interview form was included in the materials sent prior to this webinar. Completed and signed consent forms should be placed in the student files and the department doesn't need a copy. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And 
Um, our review team is flexible and willing to accommodate your particular needs around scheduling. So e even though in the letter it shows a typical day, we want the day to be set up so that it works for you and your school program. Um, Zoom site visit debriefs may be conducted with whomever um, your school chooses. We have had debriefs with just the FPPS director. We've had some that invite their entire staff, applicable staff. We've also had some that invite special ed administrators from the referring SAUs and any combination of those scenarios. We are flexible and happy to provide you and your team feedback and observations. <clears throat> Your, uh, the audience that your agency determines is most beneficial for you. And does anybody have any questions about the materials that we've covered so far before we move on to the submission guidelines for the desk audit? Good morning, Mary. Quick question for you. Okay, sure. Can you confirm when we talk about sending files from different locations, is it 10 files from each location or 10 files total? So is, um, is, is this Michelle? It is. <laughs> I can recognize your voice. It's so, it shows on my screen that it's Christine Sullivan talking. That's funny. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, it's Michelle. <laughs> so, and well, I was when I saw Christine's name, I was like, well, they only have one location, but I recognized your voice. So, you very good question, Michelle. And we um, are going to want to review ten files from each location. Okay. And and your situation is a little bit different than others. So, thank you for speaking up. Um, and it's in that you have um, several locations, and. And having been at the department for over seven years, historically, we have coupled um, the those that are in the Lewiston-Auburn area kind of together um, and actually done um, SACO and Randolph separate because, um, because they're large programs and not in the same physical location. So we'll, we'll work with you to figure out the best way to make that work. Okay, and another question, um, I'll be submitting paperwork for approval for our Brunswick location in the next week or so. Will Brunswick be included in this round? Um, no. Nope. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. What if we use partial information on an electronic database? Should we print them out? That's a great question. Um, Christine, and we've had other um, SPPSs that have complete electronic, and um, Leora um, was able to review the files using that mechanism while we were on site. And so if, um, if subsequent evidence is needed, then um, you could send it electronically or print it and mail it. Um, yeah, so whatever works for you and, and your policies. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions before I pass it on to my colleague, Sarah, to go into the desk garden element? All right. Well, good morning again, everyone. So the desk audit, we're going to review each of the desk audit in depth and submission of the desk audit materials is due by December 27th, 24. Um, again, the letter of notification and instruction includes a table containing the approval criteria along with a description of the materials associated with each of the criteria, which you will submit for your desk audit. For the desk audit, you will submit spe specific pieces of information, which we will discuss in detail in a few minutes. We prefer electronic submissions. Please provide all desk audit materials by co um, collecting evidence for each element into a separately clearly labeled attachment and send it to the sppsgss.doe at main.gov email. That stands for Special Purpose Private School General Systems of Supervision. 
Uh, one email is preferred. However, sometimes email settings prohibit a large file size and more than one email is required. Some SPPSs have also submitted folders through Google Docs or OneNote. If you send the materials in print form or hard copy, you will need a three ring binder or organizer with 12 tabs. Each tab will coincide with a section of the table found on the letter of instruction. When the binder comes to the main DOE, each tab should contain the materials supporting that criterion. The materials may be emailed, mailed, or hand delivered to our office and are due by 5 p.m. on December 27th of 24. For agencies or organizations with more than one site, please provide a single submission for the agency or organization containing all the elements that are common across your agency's SPPS locations, such as the mission of the school or the plan of instruction. Elements that relate to specific schools, such as qualification of staff, can be sent in separate emails using the organizational format outlined in the table on the letter of instruction, with separate attachments for electronic submissions or tabs for a binder submission for each category. This image depicts the 12 sections of the SPPS school approval criteria table included in your letter of instruction that you will be utilizing to construct your desk audit materials. Let's begin reviewing the items on the table. The first section includes admission requirements and the general description of the program. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204 and Muser, Section 12, Paragraph 2. For this element, please submit your administrative policy manual and parent handbook that's relevant to the pieces um, described below with documented dates of approval by your board of directors and with substantial and appropriate policies and procedures regarding your general description of program, your mission of program, your disability group served, your grade level served, your capacity to address referral behaviors and concerns, your transfer and 30-day IEP meeting um, policies, and your admission requirements. Section two talks about the educational environment, and it's made up of five parts. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204, and also Muser, Section 12, Paragraph 2. Part A is going to describe how your SPPS provides a school environment to students that is safe, healthy, and appropriate. Part B, it, you're going to provide your board approved dated policies and procedures to specifically reference student access to health and medical services as specified in the SPPS initial application part 12. So there needs to be a healthcare plan and the plan for healthcare of students is going to include provisions made for medical, nursing, and infirmary care of students, training by a physician or registered nurse to all staff that administer medication to students. Then you're also going to have policies about emergency first aid, and it's going to include training of all direct service staff in emergency first aid, secure storage of adequate first aid supplies, Posting of telephone numbers for the fire department, police station, poison prevention center, hospital emergency room, and ambulance service, providing coverage to the school. Procedures to be followed in the case of illness or emergency, such as motor vehicle accidents, including methods of transportation and notification of parents. You're also going to um, send your procedures to be followed in case of fire or other type of emergencies, and your procedures for informing parents of any medical care administered to their child or of any injury or illness that requires care other than basic first aid, and procedures to be followed in case of illness or emergency if parents cannot be reached. More for the educational environment. Uh, you are going to send us innovative activities and programming that you have for your students. We'd also like to see your multi-tiered systems of support, academic interventions, and positive behavioral interventions and supports. And if your program has 
elements with increased risk, such as kitchens, heavy machinery, auto shops, carpentry, rock walls, et cetera, uh, we would like to see safety protocols for those places. Section three, qualification of staff. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204, and MUSER 12.2A. Documentation for all staff for this element should include the special purpose private school certification form. Um, this form will be used for the desk audit sections three, six, and seven. So please send it only one time in section seven and we'll find it there when we need it. Um, we try, we're trying to make less work for you folks so that we can get it all in one place. Um, we also need the schedule of appropriate supervision of ed techs as outlined in user 10.2 and chapter 115. Uh, reporting of staff qualifications is also a requirement for general annual school approval. So we'll be able to access the information for any education staff that was employed by your school and reported on your annual general school approval application submitted to Pamela Ford Taylor. So we're going to ask in column uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, in column F, um, we're going to ask that you only provide the certificate or license number for educational staff that have been hired after you submitted your documentation to the DOE for your annual general school approval. And we're going to ask for the license number for all of your related service providers. Um, when you do your general school approval, they look only for fingerprints, and we are going to check and look them up in their uh, specific licensing. Bureau. So this should be reported. Yep, so that we can verify their certification and licenses. Um, you may design your own way of reporting this information, or you may use the form that we have set out. Um, you have already, and you will again receive it electronically after this presentation. Um, okay, so all elements of section three except for element B, are captured on this form. And so again, please just send it once in section seven and we'll know where to look for it. Section four, professional supervision. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, section 7204 and MUSER, section 12, paragraph two. The MUSER language for professional supervision includes at least one full staff member full-time staff member shall be designated as the educational administrator for the program. Such person shall be assigned to supervise the provision of special education services in the school and ensure that the services specified in each client's IEP are delivered. Each SPPS must employ an on-site supervisory person, the educational administrator. MUSER outlines two pathways each have multiple certification options. One pathway is to employ an educational administrator who has either an educational administrator O30 or an assistant, oh, special ed O30, or an assistant director of special education O35 certification. The second pathway requires supervision by an O30 or O35 for a minimum of five hours monthly. The, educational administrator may hold one of three certificates. A special education consultant, 079, which has been eliminated, but if the employee previously held this cert certification and it didn't or doesn't lapse, then the certification was or will be grandfathered. They could hold a special educator 282 or a teacher of children with severe impairment 286 certification. This is very important. If the educational administrator holds a 282 or 286, they must also have a master's degree in special education or related and one year of administrative experience. Again, please note that if you use an 079, 282, or 286 as your educational administrator, on-site supervisor, 
Muser states that the individual holding that certification must have at least five hours per month of supervision by a special education administrator 030 or an assistant director of special education 035. Please include supervision logs for 2024, January through November in this tab if, you, if the latter model of supervision is being used at your SPPS. Section five, plan of instruction. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204, and Muser, Section 12, Paragraph 2. This approval element asks for the curriculum that you're using in your school. Is it a curriculum adopted from one of your referring SAUs? Have you created your own curriculum? Please submit documentation of the curriculum that you're using, including general curricular materials for all nine content areas, as well as intervention curricular materials to close ELA and math achievement gaps, and demonstrate that it is in alignment with the main learning results. We also ask for a description of the assessments you are using in your school. Muser section two, paragraph four defines assessment as follows. For children three to 22, assessment under part B means the ongoing procedures used by appropriately qualified personnel to measure the educational and functional achievements of students as related to their IFSP or IEP goals and on state and district wide tests, which are aligned with main learning results. In this section, we want to see how your school is measuring educational and functional achievement and what assessments are being used with the curriculum to measure progress and to demonstrate student proficiency. You should also describe in this section how your school is providing access to the general education curriculum and to extracurricular activities for your students. What processes do you have in place for this to occur? Please do not send your entire curriculum. Outline, curricular maps, links to your online curricula are appropriate. Importantly, we will use your most recent standards-based report to help satisfy parts of this element. In addition, please do not duplicate what was provided for your 2023 SPPS transition to standards-based reporting. You will also need to submit a 2024-25 school calendar that demonstrates a minimum of 175 days uh, student instructional days, as well as sample classroom schedules that provide an average of 25 hours per week of instructional time for every two week period. DOE rule chapter 127 uh, defines instructional time as that portion of a school day devoted to the teaching learning process, but not including extracurricular activities, lunchtime or recess. Time spent on organized field trips related to school studies may be considered instructional time but the instructional time counted for extended field trips shall not exceed a normal school day for each day of the field trip. Please be certain that if you provide functional skills SDI time, um, functional skill SDI during times such as lunch and recess, your classroom schedules should reflect that. Section six, adequacy of support services. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204, and MUSER, uh, Section 12, Paragraph 2. Information for Section A will be documented on the Special Education and Related Services Provider Certification License Form, also submitted for Sections 3 and 7 that we discussed, and we'll find it in Section 7. Uh, we also, uh, for section B, the sample related service grids are provided in Word format and as an Excel spreadsheet. The Excel spreadsheet is formatted to calculate the data that you enter. Uh, so it'll show um, whether or not you have makeup minutes that you need to do. These forms were previously sent to you electronically you should fill in the key at the bottom of the form to include any reasons that the student may not receive services. If other is used as a category, it needs to be defined in order to determine whether the missed services need to be made up. These are sample forms that you may choose or not choose. Uh, and I know that there is an agency who is has their own forms and we don't wanna duplicate your work. So if your forms that your agency 
is using already have all the information on them, that is fantastic. So we are going to ask for you to please send a copy of your form to the sppsgss.doe at main.gov email by October 27th so that our team can review it and provide feedback as necessary before the desk audit submission. We want to ensure the necessary components for monitoring are included in a streamlined format. Um, so your former system needs to include what related services are required and documented on each IEP for their frequency and duration, to document the services and times delivered, document the services and times that were missed, document reasons for the missed services because not all are required to be made up, document service and times that were, that were made up, can be a code such as use of an asterisk within your reporting system, and tracking of cumulative services times owed for each service for each student. Data will be submitted for every related service provider, including all employed and contract providers and providers from partner SAUs utilized to serve the students at your SPPS for five months, including two months from the spring and or summer of 2024 if your SPPS provided services in the summer and the three months from September to November 2024. Include in your program approval Yep, included in your program approval submission materials. You also need to submit evidence of individualized treatment using valid and reliable measures to obtain baseline data and progress monitoring, your list of tools and evaluations that are used to inform your service plans. We're halfway through the 12 sections. Any questions? What is the most muddy for you? Hey, Sarah, it's Audra. Hi. Hey, I have a question about the plan of instruction. I'm sure you're not surprised. I have a question <laughs> about the plan of instruction section. Okay. Um, so conceivably, if we're not submitting anything outside of our last proficiency plan, um, all you would really need from us is our school calendar and our classroom schedules. Is that accurate? If, yes. Okay. And then- yes. If your plan of if your plan of proficiency covers all of those things, and yours is pretty comprehensive, so off the top of my head, that might be right. Okay. Um, and then we haven't gotten our letter back yet from our last submission, and I just want to make sure that as we go into the audit and planning over the summer, that anything you might have identified as an area of need, we would be able to address before you come here. That makes um, perfect sense. Okay. Yep. So, um, and your letter is in the queue. Perfect. To be, to be done. Yep. Thank you. You are welcome. Great questions. Any other questions? Okie doke. Let's move on to section seven. Teacher-student ratio and caseloads. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 4502, and User Section 10, Paragraph 2. So this information will be documented on the form that we send um, that's also been submitted for the other Sections 3 and 6 that we discussed. You will need to include um, the form. It says, my notes here say read slide, but <laughs> it's just the form. Note that MUSER teacher-student ratio only apply to self-contained classrooms. All other classrooms are subject to the public school teacher-student ratio stated in Title 20A, um, Section 4502. For the record, all classrooms at SPPS are self-contained classrooms because SPPS only serves students with disabilities. Section eight is your continuum of special education services. This approval element can be found in user section 12, paragraph two. And for this approval element, explain how the services you provide to your students assist them in moving along the educational continuum toward a lesser restrictive environment. 
include the range of educational settings included in the continuum of LRE as outlined in user section 10 paragraph 2. Um, you can use the template please um, for section B. You can use the template. Um, so we're going to have your student, one student, and their home district, and you're going to give us three opportunities for that student with details and timelines and dates. So we would like to have five students and several LRE opportunities for each of those five students. And please remember that um, you are focusing on least restrictive environment even within your school because if a student comes in and needs um, two-on-one -on -one staffing and then learns the skills and moves down to one-to-one, -to -one, that's still moving towards a least restrictive environment. So you folks are all doing that internally, as well as when you're starting to transition them back to public school. Here's more criteria for the a continuum of special education services. Um, also submit specific discharge data for the past two years, including the student name and the date of birth, their disability, their admission date and discharge date and their grade level, the name of the receiving school or program, or if they graduated. And Sarah, before you move on, if I could, yes. um, I just want to uh, reiterate too, great job talking about the fact that folks do LRE within their own school and also when students are transitioning back, but it actually also happens all the time, not just at the beginning and the end or um, with communities of um, origin as well as communities of treatment. Um, mm -hmm. so, so just be mindful that you are, give yourself credit for all the hard work that you're doing all the time that you have a student with you. Yes, super. Thank you, Mary. Um, desk got at section nine. This is only for those schools who serve grades nine through 12 and your graduation diploma agreement. This approval element can be found in MUSER Section 12, Paragraph 2, and the 24-25 Diploma Agreement was sent out in May and was included in the paperwork Gay sent previously. This submission includes copies of annual graduation work credit agreements with sending schools or schools of residence signed by the SAU high school principal and evidence of the documentation of data tracking and reports for graduation work credit agreements, as well as graduation requirements, such as courses, community service, et cetera, outlined by the SAU. A new work diploma agreement needs to be signed each year for all students in grades nine through 12 before the school year starts. High school diplomas can only be conferred by the principal, meaning only the principal can sign the diploma agreement. State law prohibits other staff positions, such as the special ed director or superintendent being the sole signatory. State law does not prohibit additional SAU signatures to meet unique situations, such as communities without a high school. If so desired by the high school administrator conferring the diploma, so in addition to the principal or dean of students, the special ed director or superintendent also may sign. Um, and so if you are having issues getting these returned to you, please reach out to us and we can be helpful. Sarah, it's Audra again. Hi. What, hi, what school year do you want those for? Because you'll be coming summer or fall, so you want this current? Uh, well, we'll, we're coming after July 1st, so okay. it'll be 24-25. Okay. I will try my very best. I know, <laughs> and, and you've You've um, asked for my help, so we totally understand, and we will absolutely take that into consideration. And hopefully you'll get it before December when they're due. <laughs> Great question, thanks. Um, moving on to section 10, notification and reporting of serious events. This approval element can be found in MUSER par section 12, paragraph two, and in MUSER, uh, well, Section 12, Paragraph 2A, as well as Section 12, Paragraph 
to D. This should be noted that it's a distinctly different policy of notification legally required, such as mandated reporting. This is a user expectation. So oftentimes, um, because you folks are duly, you're working with a whole bunch of different agencies, we see like main care um, notification and and general ed notification and sometimes the actual user language is missing. So please, please make sure that you um, send us the actual user uh, language. And title, um, user section 12, paragraph 2D says that any changes to the application, including but not limited to change in personnel, facilities, staffing patterns, or population served requires the submission and approval of amendments to the relevant portions of the application. So if anything changes, um, we need to know that. And a great example of that recently, for just to give folks a little bit of context, if your program director, for example, changes, you should be calling us to, or emailing us to let us know. That's part of the notification. Yes, thank you. Um, so section 10 has several um, sections in it. <laughs> Both general private school approval found in Title 28, Chapter 17, and MUSER requirements found in Section 2, uh, sorry, Section 12, Paragraph 2, Parts A and D. The submission includes your SPPS um, policy for notification and reporting to the department any issues that would impact the approval status of your school or program as specified in the SPPS initial application, Part 13, including any substantial changes to the school programs, any changes in the certification and or credentials of the staff, any action taken by a federal, state, or local agency that might jeopardize the school approval with the department, or any legal proceedings brought against the school or its employees arising out of circumstances related to the care or education of any of its students, regardless of their state of residency. Any new or revision to existing policies that replace or revise policies described or provider described or provided with this application. Sorry for the typo. Any changes to the program or facility that impact the overall health or safety of students or the ability to deliver services. Continuing with section 10, we also need immediate notification of reporting of serious events, including serious injury or death of a student, criminal activity on the part of the student or staff member, or other serious incidents affecting the well-being of any student and approval, an approved special purpose private school shall immediately notify by telephone and by letter the parents, the sending school districts, any state agency involved in child care or program placement, and the Department of Education. We will also need to know any changes in services or staff, including temporary staff shortages that alter previously approved staff, ch staff child ratios and or affect the ability to deliver services to students per their IEP. We need to know if there's a change in the program director. We need to know if uh, any update to your initial approval application had any changes. So um, we know that a lot of people have their initial application was many, many years ago. Um, so we are going to take that into consideration also. Um, please note that MUSER specifies the notifications in section six situations must occur immediately, both by telephone and by letter. And, and that's that's that slide. Here's section 11, your rule governing physical restraint and seclusion. This approval element can be found in Maine Department Education Rules, Chapter 33. Chapter 33 notes that each covered entity must provide annual overview and awareness information to staff and provide annual notice informing parents of the Chapter 33 rule and the SPPS policy and procedures related to the use of restraint and seclusion, including the local complaint process. 
Your policy should note when your board of directors last reviewed and approved the policy to ensure the most recent legislative requirements are included in your policy. For this cohort, um, the most recent rules were, um, were put out on June 16th of 2023. All crisis intervention curricula will be reassessed for compliance with the updated rule. Every SPPS needs to update their policies in accordance with the changes. Um, in addition, we would need documentation of training of your crisis intervention curriculum, including the dates and frequency and a list of, particip of participants. We've gone through 11 sections of the desk audit and final section, Leora will walk us through. Is there anything you have questions about or is muddy for you from the first 11 sections? Hey, Sarah, quick question. It's Michelle. Yeah. I think that um, our policy says we'll notify the DOE by um, phone call and email. Is that sufficient for a letter? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, yep, because um, MUSER allows for electronic submissions of things. Perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. And sure. I just want to note too, on the last slide, when talking about the training of the crisis intervention curriculum, it's also for part D, the, the training itself to staff. Yes. Thank you. Anything else about one through 11? Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Leora. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, so we are going to start with section 12, which is the last piece of the desk audit. So this is the self audit of student records. So this is where you'll use the on site review monitoring tool, which we call the OSR. That is a comprehensive tool provided in both word format and an Excel format. The Word version is a guidance document which includes criteria and corrective activities for each item being covered. You'll use the Excel version to complete your self-audit. The self-audit is the final component of the desk audit and is the same tool used for site visit file reviews. So I'll be reviewing the Excel workbook that you will use for your self-audit. So we recognize that the sending school is responsible for the IEP and for approval of the IEPs developed and implemented at SPPSs. The IEP writing trainings and B13 trainings for writing transition plans conducted by the DOE Public School Federal Monitoring and Support Team are open to SPPS staff. We encourage you to go to those. Um, the DOE Aussie professional learning training recordings can be be accessed at um, it's our uh, the DOE website learning slash special ed slash um, PL professional learning. Yes, and I would think that um, people would want to open up their OSR and walk with you through them. So this would be a good time. Indeed it is. So you'll notice that um, there is there's some examples of OSR codes on the slide. So we're, you're not responsible for remembering those or anything. Um, those are just three letters and a number that um, communicate to us which um, element that it is referring to. So as Sarah said, if you um, are planning to go through the tool with us, which we hope that you will, because you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, then this is a good time to, um, whoops, to get that ready to go. So when we're talking about the self-assessment piece, um, we are, hold on, I'm trying to juggle looking at, perfect, thank you, Sarah. Um, so you're going to use the self-assessment form to review 20%, but not less than 10 of your current student files. And it's not the form, it's an OSR. So if your student population is less than 10, then all student files will be reviewed for this element, as well as for the file review during the site visit. So if you have any questions about how many files to look at for your self-assessment, you can reach out to us if that's confusing for you. So we really want to have a good representation of the population of students that are 
with you. So as you're look, you're checking through your files for which students to include in your self-assessment, um, please include a variety of disability categories, um, ages of students, including transition plans. Those are part of the OSR. Um, ethnicities, different case managers, different SAUs that send to your SPPS, um, and state agency client, state board statuses. So those are all things to think about as you're looking for students to um, really uh, put on your self audit and have it be a good representation of the students that you serve. Okay, so hopefully you have your OSR out. I just want to note that I am demonstrating on um, a PC. You probably use Macs. That can be a little bit challenging because Excel and the Google numbers don't always communicate clearly. Um, and we do know that, but the state um, likes us to use PCs, so that's what that's what we use. So here on the screen, you should have in front of you a snip of the on-site review Word version. So the Word version is a document created by the Federal General Supervision and Support Team um, that we share with them. And it goes through each of the elements that are covered in the OSR and gives you very um, clear directions for what you're looking for, for criteria. Does that particular element meet criteria? Yes. Does it not meet criteria? It is a no. Um, or could it be an A? And then also, um, details what the corrective action would be if um, the answer is no, that that specific element does not meet um, uh, compliance. Okay, so Sarah, I already went through the next slide. So um, if we could, okay, so we're going to look quickly at your Excel version. So was everyone able to open your Excel workbook for your OSR? Does anyone have any basic questions about that piece? Everyone's doing OK with that. Hopefully this isn't new information for anybody. Um, I, I think I see a lot of familiar faces here. So I know that a lot of you have worked with the tool before. So you'll see that the SNP that we have is from 2223. So the one that you get will be, um, you know, in the correct obviously year, but you can see that we're looking for the name, the review team would be me, the review date will be when we're reviewing um, and it looks for the first piece of information pieces of information to input into the OSR are the demographic information for for the client for the, your students, um, the responsible SAU, um, the IEP deter the date of enrollment is super important um, because that's where we really start looking at um, OOU5 for that 30 day review piece. Um, so all of that information is that demographic piece. And you, if you get an error message, which does happen because we know that sometimes Excel can be finicky with us. So each cell has a drop down menu and the only um, values that are accepted are a plus, minus, or sometimes an NA. NA is not applicable, so there are some elements that you can do an NA, um, for example, for academic progress. Um, that can be NA because you might have a student who only has functional needs and doesn't have academic needs, just for example. Um, some of the evaluation sections that you look for have NA as an option because you may have a student who doesn't get OT services as a related service. So those um, so those particular pieces of the OSR may have NA available to you. If NA is not available to you, it means that there shouldn't be an option for that at all. So you'd really be going back to that plus or minus. If you entered a value that's not valid, then it's going to come up with this particular um, error uh, message for you. And for that piece, you just want to click cancel and um, go to the appropriate selection that you want, either plus, minus, or NA if it's one of those, and then make sure to click enter afterwards. And it should go down to your next available box.
Um, so here we have an example. So the purpose of this slide is to show you what you'll see as info for each individual cell. The total level of compliance calculates automatically. So if you're putting in a plus, it means that your um, submission for this particular element has all of the criteria uh, that meet compliance. So if you look in the criteria box, it tells you exactly what you're looking for, for a yes answer or a no answer. And you can see this particular one is the academic um, annual progress piece, and that also does have that NA option. So when you look over towards the right, it auto populates to compl the compliance um, percentage. So you can see there's a plus, there's a minus, um, and those two exemplars, student exemplars. So the total level of compliance is uh, 50%. Um, okay, and I think I hit everything. Yeah, okay. All right, so here we have, oops, hold on, there we go. Um, okay, so the next slide looks at that demographic information. So you can see that gray box has the information that you're going to put to the right of it, the response responsible SAU, so who is the sending school district? What is the date of the date of emplace, placement with your school? What's the, the student's first name, their last name, their date of birth? What is their disability category? If you get a um, a message that's just X uh, pound signs across, it means that your column needs to be widened. It's not wide enough. And even after working for five years with these, that one got me last year. So um, <laughs> there is, you know, the, the learning curve for Excel spreadsheets and, and workbooks continues on um, as we use it them. Does. Thank you, Leora. And um, so this would, I think, would be an awesome place for people to get into their workbook and do some make, made up students. So, uh, you know, Minnie Mouse comes to mind for me. I don't know who you guys want to do on this nice hot summer day. So please um, put some put some data in your OSR. You, we can delete it. You can delete it later on. Great idea. Because folks might have a question after they're playing around with a little with it a little bit. Does anyone have any questions coming up? Okay, so I'm not hearing any questions. I'm going to go on to the next slide. This is a really good opportunity to, to play around um, where we're right here. Um, but you can always reach out with emails. Um, you know, as, as questions come up during the process where you're filling the OSR out. Um, okay, so you hopefully can see that the data is automatically populating in the boxes to the right of criteria. Um, you can move around the sheet with either arrow keys or tab keys, but when you're entering data from the keyboard, you have to hit enter afterwards. Um, so after you put in that plus or minus, just make sure to put enter, press enter, and it will drop down to the next box. Everyone doing okay? Okay. Um, so you can select one column to check the data on one individual child by hovering the cursor over the letter on the top gray bar that aligns with that particular child. Um, here are some, ex some more um, tips and tricks. So hiding the features is really helpful because it pulls the current student that you're, the current column that you're working on with that particular student over closer to the criteria on the left. So hiding those rows and columns makes it a little bit easier to work with. So you can do that by hovering your cursor over the first column or row that you want hidden and move it to the last column or row you want hidden and then just right click um, and select hide on the menu. 
So that gives you a chance to pull everything closer over to the criteria so it's easier to work with that information because your column is right up against um, the criteria that you are looking for. The other thing that you can do, that, do to um, help keep the screen a little bit cleaner um, and keep your students closer to your criteria is to freeze panes. Um, this keeps the child name column visible and allows the subsequent columns with the child uh, child's information to scroll. So for this piece, you can click on column I, which is the first call the first child's information column, and then click view on the menu bar click freeze panes and then you can go back and unfreeze the panes with the same process so I prefer to hide I know Jennifer Gleason prefers to freeze it's all really about you know what works for you when you're filling out the tool and speaking of that Leora could you let folks know what a basic distinction is between hiding and freezing like what's the purpose obviously you talked about hiding and what what how are they different? Um, well, so if you freeze panes, you can continue to scroll the kid that, you know, the information okay. stays where you want it. Whereas if you are hiding them, then they're, they're hidden, but you see just the, um, the information that you have. So it's really personal preference, you know, which, which way you like to work with it. Um, I started hiding from day one, so that's what I'm comfortable with, but, um, you know, you can do whatever, whichever one works for you. Thank you. Absolutely. So does anyone have any questions about the OSR? Does anything seem confusing? You can call, you can um, email when you're working on it, and I'm happy to zoom in or, you know, just talk with you, whatever, whatever works for you. Okay, well, I think I'm giving this back over to Mary. Is that true, Mary? Yes, you are. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, after the site visit and the desk audit, the department issues letters of finding, one following the site visit debrief, which summarizes the site visit monitoring activities findings, and the other following the evaluation of the SPPS desk audit materials, and is sent by the end of January of 2025. The letters will highlight accolades, as well as communicate if there were findings of concern that might affect continued approval status, these are a summary of all the findings that were mentioned during the site visit and the desk audit. As I just noted, the site visit letter of finding has two components <clears throat> that are sent together in one comprehensive correspondence. <clears throat> um, the uh, narrative which captures the information from the site visit monitoring activities and is reviewed in the site visit debrief, <clears throat> as well as the evidence of correction grid created by, the X, by Excel from the site visit SPPS student file review. There may be findings and therefore corrective activities requested for both parts. In review, the letter of finding reports, including the summary of findings, evidence of correction grid from the site visit uh, review will be sent to both SPPSs and their SAUs partners. Um, it should be recognized that letter of findings are informational for the SAU and no corrective activity will be required from the SAU unless state free appropriate public education is impacted. SPPS file review corrective activity is for future work rather than fixing past errors. If training is required to address multiple findings in the file review, please send only one letter of assurance that identifies all training provided for all of the findings. Um, in addition, for IEP corrections, please send IEPs developed after the findings were issued, and those could be annual reviews, amended IEPs, or drafts if not yet approved and issued by the SAU expected that five students' IEPs will show evidence for all the identified areas requiring correction on the IEP, three of which <clears throat> would um, demonstrate the required transition-related corrective activity, 
if um, included in, in your SPPS finding. Therefore, a total of five IEPs should be submitted per SPPS site to demonstrate all necessary file review correction. Note only the portions of the IEP relevant to the SPPS monitoring will be evaluated on the IEPs that are selected for the file review. And when you're sending additional evidence required, please only scan the sections of the IEP or include the sections of the IEP that are required for evidence review. Isolated deficiencies, um, if there are any that are discovered during the file review that impact the provision of FAPE, they will need to be corrected and will be reported to the federal monitoring team. And the, just like I gave um, earlier as an example, if um, related service times are not subtracted from SDI, that could be viewed as a, a FAPE um, issue. So that would need correction and could be done um, through uh, an IEP without an IEP um, amendment without a meeting. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And once you receive your letter of findings, whoops, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. All right, once you receive your letter of findings, you'll have until um, May 9th of 2025 to submit corrective evidence. Evidence that satisfies an element or result in such element not being on the corrective action plan. Outstanding findings on May 9th will result in a corrective action plan from your S for your SPPF. <clears throat> uh, corrective evidence is welcomed as early as it's completed. Uh, it's an interactive process with support and efforts to resolve um, deficiencies without issuing a cap. Early submissions are encouraged and reviews will be timely. Feedback will be provided and subsequent submissions reviewed with updated feedback upon review. So just to review the date, corrective action plan is issued for anything outstanding um, as of May 9th, 2025. The evidence of correction for the cap would be due May, uh, September 19th of 2025 with uh, continued approval uh, by November 14th of 2025. Evidence for only outstanding elements on uh, the cap can be submitted up until September 19th. Approval could be impacted up to and including revocation for any schools that have not sufficiently resolved all the identified areas needing to be addressed in the cap by September 19th. And just like always with other processes, those of you that have been involved would know if there's a need for an extension for extenuating circumstances, then we will obviously consider that and have um, granted those historically. The state agency program team expects to support SPPS is in submitting all necessary evidence with evidence reviewed, all caps closed, and letters of continued approval sent by November 14th of 2025. Evidence, both initial and subsequent, may be submitted by email, which is our preferred method, by sending attachments to the sppsgss.doe at main.gov uh, email inbox. Sometimes there are technology difficulties when attempting to email large attachments. Please send your evidence in as few emails as technology allows. Some SPPSs have submitted folders through Google Docs or OneNote as a way to get around that challenge. Um, evidence may be submitted uh, in the postal mail to Uh, the, the Department of Education, Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education, State Agency Programs Team, 23 State Health Station, Augusta, Maine, 04333-0023, sorry, State Health Station. <laughs> and for the SPPS is identified as having fiscal audits. Barbara will contact you to let you know of your participation. She will need the following information from your agency. 
um, audited financial statement for FY24, <clears throat> your schedule of main care revenue for your agency or your SPES, not your whole agency, because some of you guys offer other services. Um, written methodology allocation of your parent company overhead, as well as companies uh, copies of any management agreements with your parent company. Um, also a breakdown of interest expense to assets and a schedule of depreciation if you have any for your um, SPPF and a list of all personnel from your staff pay sheet that includes their name, title, and annual salary. <clears throat> For the SPPS is identified as having fiscal audits, Barbara will contact you to let you know of your participation. Um, oh, I already read that one, sorry, lost my place. <laughs> <laughs> the SPPS fiscal monitoring consists of a desk audit, a site visit, a letter of finding, and an opportunity to respond in writing to findings, which is due within 30 days of receipt of that letter of finding. Um, and the specific date for the SPPS fiscal monitoring activities will be outlined in the SPPS initial notification of fiscal monitoring. And I'm going to turn it back to Leora to provide us with some important reminders. Okay. So when you are sending in evidence, it's very important to only send in the pertinent section of the IEP. Um, as some of you guys know, um, if we see things that are not compliant, then we have to ask for correction. Um, so that can really turn into a, a, a snowball. So please only send what we need to see. Um, please label each submission with pertinent OSR code. So if you're wanting us to look for a particular element, which you will be, then please make sure that it's really clear what you want us to what you want us to see. Um, one IEP either may or should be sent and labeled with more than one code. So one IEP can be used for as many of the codes as you would like to towards um, towards your LOF or, or CAP submissions, just make sure to put on it the labels of the elements that you want us to be looking at in that piece. Um, and one letter of assurance or one draft letter to SAUs can be applied to more than one element as well. So you don't have to send an individual, you know, document for every single piece. You want to get as much, you know, quote unquote, bang for your buck as you can. So um, look at what you're sending in, see whether that can be used for more than one element, and we are happy to do that. Uh, okay, does anyone have any questions? What what still needs some clarification for folks? Everything's looking good. Every, everybody's ready to, to go pick files. Yeah. Leora, this is Daphne. Hi. Hi. And are we going to be going over all of the specific sections of the self-audit? We're not planning to go over each specific section, no. Um, but I have you... questions about them. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm happy to, um, why don't you reach out and Sarah and I are happy to meet with you and we can, we can go over any questions that you have. Okay. People may have some of the same questions. Right. That's what I was going to say. We do have okay. some time. So I, if they're applicable, do you think, to everybody, then... Yes, let's um let's hear some of them. All right. right. Yeah. Go ahead, Daphne. Oh, you're muted again. Yeah, they can see. I'm just gonna go right through this list that I have. Okay. So OOU two out of units placement. Yep. So with that, in terms of sometimes there are varying degrees of wording that the SAU is using when they go to the written notice. And yeah. I just wanted to run a few by you because I'm questioning them and I just want to see, because maybe I'm in error of that. So this is one example where it says to document FAPE, you know, from in your uh, written notice, the IEP agreed, this is the least restrictive environment that proves FAPE at this time. 
would you accept that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that that is a statement about um, LRE, and there, I would assume that there would be a little bit more detail in different sections of the written notice for that, but for an LRE statement, that would document that piece. Okay. okay. Um, then... my, 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 I'm sorry, I apologize for interrupting. I'd like to suggest, and if you could um, find it, Sarah, please, it would be helpful, I think as questions are being asked that are specific to the OSR tool to have up that metric that um, the, the uh, word version that Leora reviewed earlier that actually specifies what the evidence is, is that you have uh, or that we look for uh, to meet, to have something meet or not meet. Um, and that way we can reference that specific evidence as folks are asking questions to the different um, codes. I have the OSR up, but I don't have the Word version up. Sarah, do you have that close by? I'm looking for it. While she's pulling it up, I, uh, again, apologize for interrupting. I just thought it might be helpful for folks sure. that are visual. Um, and so you can go back and start your next question. And we can always refer to that as it opens up. This was another one. Um, team considered Jay's current placement and rejected it since blank, which is the name of the SAU, is no longer the least restrictive placement. Okay. So if I'm looking at the OSR piece of that, um, it's it's looking for clearly documenting the discussion of the out of unit placement with all of the IEP components specific to the student's needs. So we're looking to make sure that that discussion covers um, what the student's needs are specifically. So would you accept what I just read as your LRE? I'm sorry, could you read it again? Sure. Team considered Jay's current placement and rejected it since blank is no longer the least restrictive placement. As long as there's some reason in the written notice about why there's why that is not the the least restrictive environment for him at that point. Sure. So, so what's showing on the screen for LRE2 talks about a discussion, not oh, there it is, a yep. sentence, but a discussion, as well as options that were considered and why they were rejected. That's an actual specific part on the written note, section four, I believe. Right. So it's the, it is that statement, but there should be reasons for the statement documented there as well, supporting right. that statement. Absolutely. Quickly, what is, it's like sometimes I think in order to get all the components of this one addressed, you have to look at section two, section three, mm -hmm. and section four. Yeah. So it's all right that we're looking, because we're really trying to find all the pieces, but sometimes when we sent a communication to an SAU and just say, we talked about more than this, could you please put more into that written notice? The response is, that's all we have to do is a statement such as what I just read. So we tend to be hard on ourselves. So you are correct in that there are different locations within the written notice that things are documented. And when I read the item citation for LRE2, because one part of it talks specifically about other options and reasons rejected, I happen to know that that language is specific wording that is used in question four on the written notice. So so when Leora is doing the file review, she's going to be reviewing the entire written notice. And so for purposes of your self audit, you would do the same thing, right? You, so you're exactly correct. You might not, it's not gonna be in section two or three. This, this one piece of that um, item citation is gonna be found in section four. 
you. Um, going now to 035, which is the 30 day review. Mm -hmm. It seems that uh, we're getting quite a few that are like 31 days. And I just want to clarify how you count those 30 days. So in terms of you start the day a child is their first day here at Margaret Murphy, and then you count from the day they start 30 days, correct? Yes. Okay. So sometimes what it seems like people are doing, they're going, say if a child was started on the 8th, what some of the SAUs have doing is they're, they're going 8 to 9 is 1, and then they're counting forward, which that means is you're going to wind up the way that I count, you'd wind up on 31 days. Okay. So, um, go ahead, Mary. I was just going to say that you start your 30 days on the day that the IEP team determines will be the initial day of school at the SPPS, right? What's yes. on the service page? You're identifying the duration of this service. So it begins on the day that the IEP team determines. Right. Correct. And that's that's regardless of whether Johnny or Susie are in attendance on that day. So if something happens and Johnny is sick or Susie ends up in the hospital, that's still day one, because that's what the IEP team determined. Right. And it is 30, 30 calendar days. Currently, oh. we have taken feedback from both SAUs and SPPSs and our our. Um, advocating to change that actually to a lengthier period of time um, in recognition that um, especially in the summertime, it's difficult to, uh, to actually do that. So. Sometimes, sometimes at the IEP meeting, they don't give the exact start date. We have the start date in our records but sometimes the IEP does not say the student will start at this date. That is part of the OSR. So we, we do need that information in the student demographic information at the top of the OSR. Yeah, and we, we do have it because we have it in yep. our records, but it's just not but part of the IEP. It should be part of the IEP in the service the grid. Service Section right. seven, the dates right. that they start with you. Right. The duration going, of the IEP oh, would outline when they're supposed to start that service, that SDI service. Right. Or the day treatment service um, right. that they're getting from you that they weren't getting before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just note that day treatment is not an education term. It's a medical term. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it does go in the thing. Yep, it does go in, in, in the grid somewhere. Any other questions, Daphne? You're muted again. Oh, I have a lot. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, under LRE two, the LRE statements, people we usually see them in the annual IEP written notice. Does that need to be referenced on all IEP meetings? The written notices, no matter what the purpose is of the meeting. That is a really good question. And I am here to tell you that Muser only requires that conversation be documented once a year. So it makes sense from an SAU perspective that they choose to do it um, at an annual. Okay. Um, but, uh, but, you know, they can do it as often as they want to cover their themselves. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. That's great. Yep. Yep. Um, and then and the other one. Daphne, what can I add to that, Daphne? Um, so we understand 100% that the SAUs own the IEPs. But mm -hmm. what SPPSs could do is make sure that when they are at a at an IEP that they bring up LRE. Right. And that's and what we it, are. We are doing that. And, excellent. And I think it's just a matter of how comes sometimes how that is written in the written notice compared Certainly. to what was discussed at the meeting. And and you right. And so if you're having a lot of issues with that um you can contact us and we can we can do some brainstorming on how to make sure your SAUs are um, are recording your concerns. Thank you. On LRE2, 
when you go to review, because it, sa it says current, so is it, are you looking at the most current annual written notice, or are you looking at the most recent written notice for LRE2? So when I'm reviewing the IEPs, I'm reviewing the annual IEP. Okay. Um, and so it would be the written notice that aligns with that annual IEP. Perfect. Thank you, Leora. Um, I'm just turning my pages. Sure. Um, oh, on IEP one. Mm -hmm. So when we are making the electronic copies for you, can we send the original and the fully coded IEP? Because at Margaret Murphy, that fully coded IEP will have all of the amendments on it. And then we would send all of the written notices that describe the annual and then all the amendments after that. So when I'm looking at this on site, I'm making sure that those IEPs are in the file. But what about when we have to send the electronic copies to you? Do we have to copy every single so, IEP? Sorry, I think there's some, um, you don't have to send us everything and you're you're probably not going to. So, so for this purpose, this is your own self audit for your own self reflection. So if you're missing an IEP, either in paper or electronically, and you mark a minus, you know, we're just going to note that there's no corrective activity for your own self audit. Um, if you're talking about when Leora come, when we come and Leora looks at your things, if they're on a computer, she'll sit with you at the computer and look at them. You do not need to print them out. Okay, um, that's the reason I'm asking for that, Sarah, is because last time we were told that we had to send the original IEP and every separate amendment. We couldn't send just the coded IEP with mm. all the amendments on it. And that's what I'm trying so, to clarify. Okay, that's a and last- and a great deal of paperwork. It was a great deal of paperwork. And last time we were totally virtual because we were in COVID. Okay, So yes. we were doing it all electronically last time. Perfect, thank you. I'm very so, happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'd like to make a couple of points too. Thank you, Sarah, for pointing out the self audit is a reflection tool. It's designed as a professional development activity so that if you discover something's missing, you can take action. Um, <clears throat> the, the, um, there was something else that I thought of. Oh, uh, the, the additional um, documentation for IEP pieces, Daphne, too. Um, even now, it is going to be a lot less, but depending on what um, we're needing documentation for. So if it, for example, it's for um, at annual academic or functional progress, we would need more information and more documentation because it's comparing the goals and objectives from one year to another right. at annuals, right? So those particular circumstances would require more, um, more scanning or sending. Only if you had corrective activity, because right. when we are on site and Lior is looking at your things right, and she has a finding, that's the only time you would have to email us some corrective okay. activity. Thank you right. for that clarification. That helps. Certainly. I think, um, and this is just a question. I'm just trying to wrap my head, head around this process. So we're sending, say if we have a student who's been here for 10 years, and so we're going back and we are sending you, we go back to the placement, the original initial placement, and we send that. You so, don't, you don't I'm, I'm sorry, no, you don't send that. All we need is the date of the initial placement. Okay, but you're saying, Okay, I'm see. I'm referencing back to what we did before. Yeah, yes, the, the past three. So we don't have to send you okay. copies of all those IEPs. No, past. because that was be because that was done electronically because we weren't coming in to look at your files. So because we're doing it in person, yes, a lot of those things we had to do last year, those hoops we had to go through, we don't have to go through now. That's true. Correct. Okay. A hundred percent true. Yay. 
so <laughs> so yes so Leora is going to be looking on your computer or however you have them Perfect. in your file she's going to be looking for them but you don't need to create separate copies for us to send to us thank you that is I'm just very very happy <laughs> that just took so long yes to I, it certainly did it certainly did yeah so on RAE7, the FBA evals, sometimes what happens is the, the behavior is addressed within the psychological. Mm -hmm. So we don't have an FBA mm -hmm. in that situation. So it's addressed in the other one. So do we put NA or do we, are we just going to make reference to that it's found within the psych eval? Um, you could put NA for that. Um, if it is a separate FBA, then it would... Uh, and the IEP team has determined that, then it would be, um, then I would be looking for that separate one. But if the IEP team said that that can be part of that psychological, then I'll, I'll find it as part of that psychological. Okay, thank you. Yep. On IAF4, concerning the academic uh, performance when you're looking for progress. Uh-huh. So what, sometimes what happens, you know, as you all know, is there are students who you have You've been working on a goal and things in their life have fallen apart. Their seizure activity has increased. They have all these different things, but you still need to work on this, on this, well, usually it's behavior, but it could be a, an academic skill also. Yeah. So in that situation, what we have been working very hard to do is to basically drill down on the skill to find mm -hmm. out what skills they were missing that didn't allow them to meet that, master that goal yeah would be the last one and then when we write the goal we would be able to show it's the same it's the same area but we've drilled down and picked up a, the certain skills where they need to work now sometimes what happens is if a student has had an increase in behaviors and what we've done is we have done an updated fba mm -hmm. and thus a, an updated positive support plan so if we put that in to the present level and then you make reference to it in the goal, is that going to be accepted even though we're working on the global same skill, if that makes sense? It, it does make sense. And so in that situation, I would be going back to the written notice and looking for conversation in the written notice about why the team, um, you know, stayed within maybe that same domain or maybe the goal, um, you know, was carried over and only slightly changed. Um, so that, that, you know, goes back to the importance of that written notice piece, which we do know that the district does. Okay. We have a similar situation. We have two students with uh, Rett's disorder, which is a neurodegenerative mm -hmm. disorder. Yep. And the team is working really hard to maintain some basic communication and functional skills for their quality of life. So similar. Yep. And it's just well documented. And that would be just fine. You're right, because those are degenerative um, yes. situations. Absolutely. So in the written notice, that would be um, that would be documented. Yep. Okay. Um, sometimes when, you know, when a child like comes to us from CDS, are you looking for us to compare the previous IEP that came from CDS to the current IEP or the new IEP that we're using that was developed by Margaret Murphy? Do we compare those even though they're apples and oranges? Oh, go ahead, Mary. Uh, yes. I was just going to shake my head. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. If they're with you for preschool even though our oversight is school age um, currently, um, we want to see the preschool IEP and compare it to your, the kindergarten IEP. Yeah. Let's see if we have any more. And actually, great question that reminded me of this. If you have students that you're serving in preschool, make sure that we note somehow it's noted. You know how we ask you to note the uh, date of admission for 30 day reviews, because this is something that has come up. Um, so you wouldn't need a 30 day review for a student, for example, coming from preschool into kindergarten. It's the, going to be the same SAU. And for, oh, um, for students whose <clears throat> 
um, educational programming hasn't changed. So the IEP team isn't doing something different. It's just transitioning from, okay. um, from part B littles to part B school age. Um, there is no need for a 30 day review. And we would want to have that like in bold print for transition from preschool Definitely. so that we don't um, put a negative um, and then discover later, oh shoot, that should have been a not applicable because there wasn't, there wasn't a change in educational programming. The 30 day review is only to evaluate when a, there's a major change in educational programming to make sure that the IEP team was making a good calculated um, decisions about something that would be new. So that was a great, really great clarification, Mary, because yep. when I, I've been looking at some binders and I've been putting a negative if I didn't have that 30 day review. Yep. So thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. That a lot. <laughs> yeah, great. Anything else? Those are all mine. That's it on this end. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Mary, there's a clarifying question in the chat. Um, CDS would be different from the kindergarten SAU unless they were an early adopter. So there would be a CDS to SAU transfer meeting, um, but there, but if the student was at Margaret Murphy for preschool and the SAU IEP team determined that Margaret Murphy was where they were gonna stay, then they wouldn't need a 30 day program review again. Absolutely, because again, it's the, it's, so thank you for that clarification because there are two different circumstances in CDS world, um, but because the educational programming itself isn't changing, there wouldn't be a requirement for a 30 day review and the SAU director or whomever they're designating to do their written notice would just want to note that in the written notice to like other relevant factors under section five. Educational programming is staying the same, even though this youth is transitioning um, from CBS or preschool to school age, the programming isn't changing. Therefore, even though it is an out of unit placement, a 30 day review is not not needed this might be a nuanced question that's just specific to kids piece but when so we this happens occasionally where we have a student in pre-k that it's determined at the k transition meeting that they will um come to kids piece for kindergarten and when that occurs our process has been to discharge them from one program and then it's a new enrollment with a new admission date so i'm i i'm i guess i'm wondering how that would, how we would, or should reflect that, because when we're when we're pulling these records, um, if this were to come up, they they would have a new admission date for our day treatment program. So, can you reiterate for me the change? What what changed? They changed classroom teacher. They changed the peer group and the essay the sending SAU changed. The payer source changed. So, right, no, 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 I mean, I was just looking for, if something in this student's life changed that changes the SAU, meaning it's a, an entirely different IEP team, then it is a new, it is, it is new. So if they're switching SAU. from CDS though, to like their kindergarten, that is, a, that is a full change in IEP team other than like us who, you know, they're staying in our program. Yes, you are correct. And I will I will retract what I just said. I was just thinking, I actually was in that situation um, in, an, in a review before I joined the department and I asked my predecessor, John Braff, that same thing, because when they came in, to your point, it was a student who was in custody and he, his educational, his residence, his education didn't change. His residence changed six times within six months. And we were literally having IEP meetings left and right. And what John Braff said was, if the school district, even though it's a new school district, keeps the programming the same, it, it is the same rationale that I just gave. So thank you for your patience, Lindsay, as I was thinking through this. You are right it's going to show for that particular new SAU a different admission date, but I would do the same thing as what, I, what we just discussed. And that is, if there isn't um, less restrictive programming that a new SAU is able to offer, 
so their educational programming isn't changing, then it should be noted within the written notice that a 30-day review wouldn't ne be necessary. I mean, I would hope that folks aren't moving around six times in six months like what I experienced, but I think these kids, we all know these kids are highly mobile. <laughs> Great questions. Thank you, Absolutely. Margaret Murphy, for bringing them up. And thank you for asking about all the scanning. We're not doing that this year because we're coming in person. <laughs> yes. And thank you, Kids Peace, too. Your question. And thank you, yes, <laughs> Lindsay, for your for your clarification. Definitely. <laughs> Any other questions? One more question. <laughs> this sure. is Daphne. Um, on the written notice, I'm hoping to make sure this is correct. A the SAU can put in their written notice that the accommodations were reviewed from the previous year, no changes were made, and they were accepted. They don't have to list them all if they're repeating the same ones from the year before that were on that IEP. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. You have a question? Yeah, all this talk about placement has made me think about a student <laughs> that we had a meeting to talk about the fact that they would start with us with the understanding that the parents had some stuff that they had to do, like paperwork wise, before they could come to us. The parent never came to that and is now no longer answering any phone calls. So like the last written notice indicates that the student is stuck, is already supposed to be with us, but they're not. And then what happens if they never actually start with us? Like what is our obligation to that child? We have to notify the district. Yeah, they know. If, if they're if moving been... their placement and the district has to go back to IEP, correct? But like outside of that, we don't have any other obligation like to maintain paperwork for the student because they never step foot in our building. Is that accurate? So I think <laughs> what I hear, <laughs> please, please help me understand my thinking if I'm not thinking it correctly. But I think what I hear is that there was a referral and the IEP team determined it was an appropriate referral for consideration with XYZ steps needing to take place and the XYZ steps didn't take place. The, the issue is that we have, there is a written notice out there stating a start date for this student with us. But he couldn't come because the family didn't do the XYZ. Didn't complete intake. Right, so what I, I get, I mean, go back. Mm -hmm. I think I hear, if we pulled up Muser, there are two times when an out-of-unit is supposed to be brought to the table for out-of-unit referrals. One is prior to the actual placement. If a school district knows that they have, um, that they have um, utilized the resources within their SAU, and they are unable to meet the needs of a student and therefore are likely to be referring to an out of unit placement, whether it's a regional program or a, um, an SPPS, they have to invite a party to an IEP meeting to talk about that with the parents, to actually seek permission to refer out of unit, completely separate than a transfer IEP meeting or change of program more appropriately because transfer IP meetings for school districts sometimes happen within 30 days of somebody moving into their district, right? This is a change of program when somebody goes to an out of unit and has to happen within 10 days of, of a complete change of their education program. Um, but those two meetings are separate distinct meetings. And I think what I hear is that some of that stuff was happening, happening concurrently um, and so um, I'm happy to talk through stuff with you, Audra, if that would be helpful, um, because it sounds like there might be a little bit of a concern with a with one particular circumstance. But yeah, I think that it's it's just about placement, yeah. really. And like when the 
what our obligation is, because for those instances where we have the placement meeting and it's determined a, a child would start, but then they're hospitalized, we still have to count those 30 days. So like, mm -hmm. if, but what happens if that child actually never comes to us? We've had the placement meeting, then the child is hospitalized. So we have documentation that they're going to start with us. The child is hospitalized, then they get placed out of state or they move far away. So they never actually are there are ours on paper, but we never see them. So I'm going to go back to, that's a great question. And I'm going to go back to uh, a comment that I made a few minutes ago. Anytime a youngster who is has an active IEP and is unable to participate in their educational programming for what is defined as a change of placement, which is an interruption that accumulates to 10 or more days, then there is a legal obligation for the IEP team to re-meet. So you should never get to a 30-day point where the IEP team hasn't acknowledged some circumstance or factor that is um, interrupting this person's ability to participate in their educational programming that the IEP team determined. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? About the previous question, I did put it in the um, chat earlier, but if a written notice says agreed upon accommodations, you already stated that that's fine. What if it's over several written notices? We're finding some of the um, districts have done that to us. So from the federal monitoring team's um, guidance, it is that the accommodations should be listed in the very first IEP meeting. Um, and then after that, you can just put what the changes are. And when you say that, Leora, the very first IEP meeting, you're talking about each annual, correct? I just want to make sure folks understand that it's something that is required to be done on an annual basis in case there's changes. Okay, so that might be updated guidance then. So, no. oh, so somebody could list IEP accommodations and not list them for they would say that years? they could say that the IEP um, accommodations haven't changed and they only need to list the ones that are either added mm -hmm. or, yeah. um, you know, or taken away. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. All right. Well, I think I'm not hearing any more questions, and that's a good segue to the next slide where Sarah can, uh, is going to go over our contact information in case you think of something after the webinar is over. <laughs> Okay, I am going to do that. And there it is, I found it. Um, so this is um, the state agency program team contact information, Mary Adley. Um, it's our first names and last names with a dot in between at main.gov. Um, Leora Byrus, Gay Erskine, me, and Barbara McGowan. And we will fix that typo in Barbara's email address. Um, cause she needs, she also, Barbara, I believe has her initial, uh, middle initial. It so, it's, yep, so it's that a. should say Barbara A. McGowan at main.gov. So we apologize for that typo as well. And you may find the department on the following platform on the website at www. Uh, oh, that's not right. <laughs> that's just your notes. They can't see that. <laughs> like wait a minute typos. Another typo. main.gov backslash doe got it <laughs> you can also find us on youtube at main doe com on instagram or x <laughs> um i'm not x is file is twitter sorry about that instagram at at main d-e-p-t-e-d -E -E or on x formerly known as twitter at mdoe news 
and also on Facebook at Maine Department of Education One. And that concludes our <coughs> presentation today. So thank you all for your time. We appreciate it. And thank you for your um, dedication and commitment to Maine's most, most vulnerable youth. I hope you all get to take some much deserved time away. Yes, and they get 58 extra minutes to take some deserved time. <laughs> and this recording will be posted um, and please call us. Uh, our, our motto is no angst. So That's right. <laughs> if you start if you start feeling any little bit of angst, give us a call and we will we will help you out. That's right. We're here to support. <laughs> All right, everybody, take care. Thank you. Hey, Mary. Yeah? I have, do you have a minute? Can I ask you a couple <laughs> additional questions?